Hello, good morning, everyone. Uh, can everyone hear me? All right, yes, thanks. Uh, very good morning to everyone. I'm probably good afternoon and good evening to some of you. So welcome to the online forum on the Allied Health Profession Act, which is held in conjunction with the International Medical Physics Week 2021. And my name is Ong Ye Ming. I'm a medical physics lecturer based in the Department of Clinical Oncology, University of Malaya. And I'll be moderating the session this morning. And before we start the session, allow me to go through some housekeeping information. So I'll just be sharing my screen here. Now, housekeeping announcement. All delegates will be muted and all will be on listening only mode for the entire webinar to avoid disruptions. And if you have any questions, please submit them through the Q&A tab that you should see at the bottom of your screen. Don't forget to turn up your volume to be able to hear the presentation clearly and make sure that you're able to see the slides being projected. If you don't, please re-logging again and that should solve the problem. If not, please alert us on the chat function and our technical team will assist you. You will receive an email after the webinar to fill up a, a feedback form. The link to the form will also be provided at the chat function. Please kindly complete the feedback form and upon completion, a certificate and CPD points will be awarded. Now, we all know that medical physics is an internationally recognized applied science in healthcare, which concern with the application of the principles, concepts, methods and techniques of physics to medicine. Now, according to EFORM, medical physicists are postgraduate scientists who work in many different areas of healthcare managing and delivering services and carrying out research and development. Now, in Malaysia, a medical physicist is recognized as a liar health practitioner and is one of the professions regulated under Allied Health Profession Act, which was gazetted in the year 2016 and came into force on 1st July, 2020. Now, I'm sure many of us here would like to know what this act is all about, the requirements and the implications to our professions. Now, this morning, we have three distinguished speakers who can shed some lights on the Allied Health Professions Act in Malaysia, and also to share the experience on medical physicist registrations from our neighboring country, Indonesia. We are privileged to have Mr. Saravanakuma Maniam from Malaysia Ministry of Health, Dr. Hafiz Mohammad Zin from University of Science Malaysia, and Dr. Suprianto Adjo Pawiro from the University of Indonesia as our panel speakers today. Now, to start off, allow me to introduce our first panelist, Mr. Saravana Kumar Maniam. Now, Mr. Saravana Kumar is serving as Principal Assistant Director at the Secretariat for Malaysian Allied Health Profession Council, Allied Health Sciences Division. He started his career in 2004 as Forensic Science Officer in Ministry of Health after completed his degree in Forensic Science in USM. He possesses a master's degree as well in Criminal Justice 
and analytical chemistry and instrumentation uh, from University of Malaya. Now, Mr. Kumar joined the Allied Health Sciences Division in 2015 and played a significant role in setting up a secretariat to oversee the establishments of Malaysian Allied Health Professions Council and related regulatory matters. Now, over the years, he has gained vast experience and knowledge with regards to the Allied Health Professions Act and policies on regulating Allied Health Professionals' practices. He has also actively involved in presenting papers in meetings, seminars, and conferences on the matter related to regulating the Allied Health Professionals locally and internationally. So, Mr. Kumar, thanks for Thanks for being with us this morning. Now, although the Allied Health Professions Act 774 had been gazetted in 2016 and enforced last year, some of us are still new or not entirely clear about the Act. So maybe you can introduce to us this Act to all the viewers and its current status, Mr. Kumar. Okay, uh, good morning, uh, Mr. Chaperson, Dr. Ng. Uh, thank you for the kind introductions. Um, uh, as you have raised a uh, very good question about the act was uh, gazetted in 2016. And yeah, a lot of information that people are waiting to know. And I will try my best to give some glimpse on that. Uh, let me share my uh, slide first. Okay, um, good morning, and let, let me straight go to the presentation, uh, just to give you an, an overview of what this Allied Health Profession Act is all about, and especially uh, with regards to Malaysia, uh, especially the uh, medical physicists in Malaysia. And I also will touch with a bit about the updates, so that uh, people will, will know what is actually, uh, what is, uh, what are the steps are being done, and uh, and what are the processes being going on in order for us to make sure the act uh, able to uh, perform its function, which is to register the practitioners. Okay, uh, before I go detail on that, I think I should give some kind of background. Uh, so until today, we don't have an act uh, for, uh, for allied health to be registered in Malaysia. Even though the act was gazetted, it's not the, the registration process is not still uh, enforced. So, uh, but looking at Malaysian scenario, we have other profession, uh, health health profession especially. Uh, for example, doctors, dentists, pharmacists has already been regulated for almost 20, uh, minimum twenty years ago. But allied health was was not under that under that uh, regime of regulation. Uh, we we could tend to see that approximately 30,000 allied health professionals are employed within the Ministry of Health. Uh, and then they have around 30 type of profession within the Ministry of Health. But uh, the, the data for the private sector, we couldn't have a very clear data because we don't have any registry uh, to, to refer to. So uh, looking at a lot of various issues, uh, the government have decided to regulate 23 profession uh, under the Allied Health Provision Act 2016. Um, even though the act was uh, gazetted in 2016, uh, various uh, stages have been gone through to ensure that registration can start, but uh, we are still in the, in the process of uh, making it materialize. Um, let me give you some uh, insight into the act itself. Uh, uh, Allied Health is a multi-profession act. Uh, it is a, uh, it's a new type of uh, act where it, uh, it governs a multiple profession within one council. If you refer to the world, I think only Singapore, Brunei, and also uh, UK have the similar setting, whereas in Australia, they have a usual board looking after the, uh, and other countries, especially like uh, uh, neighboring country like, uh, in Philippines and so on. So they have an individual board, but ours is a multi-professional uh, approach. Okay, at the moment, uh, only optometrists and counselor, which is fall under the jurisdiction of LIH, own act, 
uh, uh, supposed to cover 23 professions, which is listed. And if you look into the reason why the act was uh, established, because uh, the main reason is, I think, which is similar to all the countries that already enforcing uh, registration to the allied health, as, uh, especially the medical physicists, is first, they want to make sure that professional uh, possess edu uh, education and experience at the minimal level competency, and they provide the service within their designated uh, scope of practice and also act in the ethical manner and bound by the code of ethics. These are the principle of, uh, so which is similar to us. And looking at, uh, I'm just going to give you some idea that we are not the uh, on, only one, uh, only act in the Malaysia. We have medical, dental, nurses, midwife, pharmacists, and assistant medical officers, and optometrists before us. They have been regulating since uh, almost 20 years, as I mentioned before. Ours is the new addition into the act. And the only difference between the act prior to Allied Health is they all govern the registration and the practicing certificate uh, annually. Uh, but ours will be the uh, new approach where it will be governed uh, two years once, the biennial, biennial registration. That means registration will happen once and then the practicing certificate will be a biennial process. So every two years only you need to re renew once the registration starts. So this is a bit of a, a run through of what is the act all about. So any uh, practitioner would like to refer to the act, you can just download by uh, search in Google Allied Health Profession Act, you will get this uh, act. I'm just putting a summary here to tell you there are a few parts in the, uh, in the act, which is the which is the preliminary part. Uh, uh, there's a part about the council itself and the functions. And also the part three will be looking into the allied health profession itself. And part four will be looking into the registration process. And part five will be in the disciplinary proceeding. And part six will be in the offenses. So a lot of people, uh, practitioners need to focus on these offenses. If you don't comply to the act, uh, so you will be deemed to make offense against the act, then uh, uh, penalty or action should uh, will be taken on upon you, and we also have uh, enforcement. Uh, this enforcement will be given a power to go and investigate any any queries or any uh, complaints, and some general part. And in this act, also have a first schedule and second schedule. So a lot of people uh, 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 need to refer as a as a professional. They need to refer second schedule where to see whether their uh, profession are listed or not. So this is the listing. And the first schedule is how the council is managed. Okay. Uh, in 2000, July, the act came to force. So what, what that means? That means is the council, council can be established. And apart from that, there's also another important uh, element that need to focus is there are new definition for allied health practitioner based on the act. So the act actually have uh, uh, defined allied health profession and profession of allied health. So let me uh, go deeper a bit on that. Uh, allied health profession means the profession of allied health specified in section schedule and any activity relating to the prescribed by the regulation under the second uh, section eleven. So that means this, oh, referring to the listing in second schedule, you will be deemed as allied health profession, which require registration. But whereas profession of allied will be any profession which has direct and indirect effect of the patient care or on the health of individual or population. So from these two definitions, we can assume that not all allied health will be required to register. Uh, we, the, it depends on the council to decide who should be registered and some will be remain outside the registration because uh, the purpose of registration is all, mostly uh, we want to ensure safety and quality service to the patient. Sometimes some profession pose higher risk to the patient, so they need to be regulated by a statutory regulation. But some profession, they are not... Uh, we deem to be minimal risk to the uh, uh, society or to, to the patient. So they may not require registration. So, but this is depend on the council decision. 
Okay, uh, so I'm just going to give you a listed profession. So one of it is um, participant today, I think mostly come from the medical physicists. Um, let's move on to the, what is the council will do? Okay, based on the act, when the act came to force, the Malaysian Allied Health Profession Council was established. Uh, the establishment council was done on the uh, 6th of July, uh, 9th of July, I'm mistaken, uh, 9th of July. So we have now chairman, the chairman of the council will be director general of Ministry of Health and the deputy chairman will also play a role of registrar, will be the director of Allied Health Sciences Division, MOS, uh, Ministry of Health. So whoever occupy the seat of director of Allied Health will be automatically become the deputy chairman and also will play the role of registrar, whereas the chairman will be the director general. A secretary will be appointed among the registered practitioner from the Ministry of Health will be appointed as a secretary and 23 practitioner will be appointed as a council member. If the numbers increase, then the number of uh, uh, representative also will increase. Okay, so this is how the council will look, uh, is look like uh, currently. But at the moment, we don't have a secretary, but we have an officer who are uh, 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 doing the job of the secretary because we don't have a registration yet. Okay, so this is the governance of our uh, council. Uh, the council is still under the governance of the Ministry of Health. So the Division of Allied Sciences will become the uh, caretaker of the council. The chairman and the deputy chairman and the member will be the council. And the council will be assisted by a secretariat, which is I'm now uh, working here. And so we will look into the registration process, the administration process, accreditation expertise and disciplinary ethics processes. We also uh, will also will be assisted by statutory committee and this committee uh, committee that the act required to be set up which is expert assess committee investigating committee and discipline authority so once the registration start the another pillar of the governance will be the practitioners itself okay um, so Malaysian Allied Health Profession Council will be having a few functions among the top of the function will be to register and issue certificate to the registered practitioner so they will decide who can practice, who cannot practice based on the uh, qualification or based on the uh, requirement that is set by the council. And they also will determine the appropriate qualification for allied health. So after this, the council will, uh, will decide which qualification will be recognized. Uh, upon the recognition, if let's say the uh, qualification is not recognized, then they are unable to practice in Malaysia. Okay, and they will also determine the prerequisite requirement if there's any since this uh, is a multi-profession uh, council, so the needs of each profession will be differ differing, and then we need to cater to each profession. So some profession may need the prerequisite requirements, some profession may not require. So that is the, uh, the power is given to the council to decide on that. And beside that, they will, the major task will be to regulate the practice of allied health, and also to regulate the ethic and professional conduct. Uh, beside that, uh, the council also so need to supervise matter relating to the training, competency, and profession development, and also to do any other things that is required by the Act or permitted by the Act. So this is the main function of the council. So the council cannot do uh, what you call more than what is required by the Act. Okay, so they are bound by this. Okay, uh, for the registration and the practicing certificate, formulation uh, registration process will uh, will be divided into two formulation and for the non-Malaysian. For the Malaysian, it is a two-step process where they need to register first under section 17. And also after registration, they can apply for practicing certificate, which is this practicing certificate is renewable every two year once. So this is uh, the payment that already been decided. So for application purposes, uh, uh, will be 50 and registration will be 100. So the registration will be one time. The practicing certificate will be two years once renewable. Eh? Okay. And then for, uh, for the specific practicing certificate, the amount that will be imposed will be 200. Application will be 50. So altogether will be 250. And this 150 will be for the 
registration and it is one time process only. So that means once you get registered, then every two years you need to renew your uh, practicing certificate. And here, another thing we need to see is we, we didn't call the, uh, the process as a licensing process, but in the Act it's mentioned as a certificate, but it is deemed as a licensing because it's uh, based on the statutory uh, body giving a license for them to allow to practice. So it is similar meaning with the licensing. And we also have an expert registration under section 21 uh, for the uh, registered practitioners. For non-Malaysian, it's a one-step process where they only will be issued temporary practicing certificate for a period that is decided by the uh, employer. That means as long as they are, the, the service is required, they will be given a temporary practicing certificate. Once their uh, service is not no more required, then they, the certificate won't be renewed. Okay. So this is depends on the current current uh, uh, needs of the country. Okay. So that's the again. What will happen if let's say uh, once you are get registered, what will be uh, the major impact on the uh, professional? So once you are registered practitioner, complaint can be made against the registered practitioner. So I'm just going to highlight here what are the uh, what are the circumstances that will make you uh, liable for disciplinary actions as a practitioner? So if you, let's say you are contraven contravention to the, any, any, any section of the act, so definitely you will be liable for disciplinary action. Any act against the code of ethics and professional conduct will also will lead to disciplinary action. Professional misconduct, poor professional performance, uh, and information on fitness to practice, that means you may not able to practice efficiently. So if let's say people complain on that, action will be taken, uh, a preliminary uh, investigation will be done and based on that uh, discipline action, whether needed or not will be decided. And also information and any conviction on other, other offenses from other acts. So all these actions done by the practitioner will be subject to a complaint and later will be subject to, to disciplinary actions. Okay. Um, so what will happen? So uh, if you are subjected to disciplinary action, so a complaint will be received by the investigating committee. So they will see the validity of the complaints on you. And based on the validity of the complaints, they will uh, advise the council to set up a discipline authority, authority to investigate uh, further. So during the investigation, both party will be called and then both party can uh, put their arguments and uh, once the, all the information and argument is being heard, the council, a uh, disciplinary authority can make recommendation to the council so that the council can make decision. So if the decision is made by the council, uh, basically there's a three, a three decision. One is they can uh, reprimand, second, they can uh, suspend, and third, they can remove from the registry. What is the implication? If you are reprimanded, that means uh, you are given like a warning uh, to behave according to what is written in the Code of Ethics and Professional Conduct. If you are suspended, that means you are being punished to, for your action. You will be suspended minimum of one year uh, or it, it can go up to depends on the council decision. And if you are removed from the register, that means you cannot practice anymore in the, in the country. So based on that, okay? So this will be the disciplinary action, uh, which is already uh, high, uh, already in, in great, uh, already incorporated in the act itself. So uh, a little bit on the offenses, so that because this is an introduction, I think offenses is very important for you all to know as a practitioner. You cannot, if you are caught making false claim in any advertisement, journal, article, pamphlet, website, or media commercial, you will be liable under section 32 under advertisement. So uh, make sure you, uh, you are you able to provide information which is evidence-based and don't over commit yourself by claiming uh, things that you are not supposed to, to claim, okay? And then uh, under section 33, restriction on the unregistered practitioner. 
So this is pertaining to the employer. If you want to employ, make sure you you employ a registered practitioner once the registration started. I'm talking about after the registration start. If you if you uh, employ a person or unregistered, the employer also will liable for legal actions. And section 34, I did mention that is pertaining to how you obtain the registration. If you do fraud and so on, so you will be liable also. And make sure one during the registration process you provide accurate and uh, and what you call information which is correct. Don't don't send false information or don't try to uh, what you call make a false declaration on that. Okay, and section 35 will be talking about falsely impersonating or using holding as a registered practitioner, and section 36 will be looking into employing uh, who is not registered practitioner. Okay, a um, little bit of updates. So that is all about the act. I didn't want to mention deeper because you can, uh, you most of you can able to access it online and then can have a, a run through of the each section of the act. So I'm just highlighting all the important part of the act. And also uh, as I update, uh, most of you already know the act came to force on 1st of July. And we also have the allied health profession regulation uh, pertaining to the fee. These are the two legislation is already out. Okay, and then on the re registration part, registration is postponed. And the council, the first council that convened on, uh, already convened for three times, uh, so they have decided that there are still need a uh, few things need to be ironed out before we can start registration. And since the, uh, the, the approach is to make sure all the 23 able to register, so registration is postponed prior to preparation towards the setting the standards for registration and so on. So now at the moment, we are focusing on the registration standard and then registration system uh, online system and online payment. So these are the issues that we need to still uh, have need time for us to set up. Once it's set up, then we can start uh, online registration and and everybody able to start registering. And from the council point of view, the updates are uh, council established on the 9th of July. And they until today, they have uh, met three times. And during the both three times they have discussed a lot of issues. Uh, they are trying to iron out all the issues as soon as possible. And to do that, the various committee has been formed to assist the council in preparation. And this committee are looking into the registration standard, looking into the ethical part, and also some of them are looking into the, uh, whether we need to amend the uh, legislative or amend the uh, second schedule. Okay. Uh, but our decision have been made. Uh, council are in the in the midst of amending the second schedule because they found that uh, the the schedule need to be amended to facilitate smooth transition during the registration. Okay, and I think uh, the act was uh, gazetted in two thousand sixteen, but it was developed uh, almost ten years ago, so that the list of the profession was listed at that moment was was not as uh, uh, comprehensive as what is now in, available in the country. So therefore we need to amend the second schedule to reflect what is actually taking place in the country. Uh, so that is all from me uh, for introduction and then updates and reg with regards to the uh, Light Health Act. Uh, thank you very much, Mr. Kumar for a very a thorough introduction to the act. So we'll be discussing more stuff with you again later on the act. Okay. So uh, yes, yeah, let's move on to our second panelist this morning. So our second panelist is uh, Dr. Hafiz Muhammad Zin. So let me just share my screen. So Dr. Hafiz uh, obtained his PhD from the University of London, UK in 2012, after completing his research studies on real-time VMAT treatment verification at the Joint Department of Physics of the Royal Marsden Hospital and the Institute of Cancer Research London. After that, he joined the Advanced Medical and Dental Institute, AMDI of USM, 
as a senior lecturer in medical physics and also serving the radiotherapy and oncology unit. He is currently the deputy director, academic and international of the institute. And Dr. Hafiz is an editorial board member of the Ample online learning platform for the clinical training of medical physicists under IAEA. He is also the council member for the medical physicist profession in the Malaysian Allied Health Profession Council of the Ministry of Health Malaysia. Thanks again, Dr. Hafiz, for joining us this morning. So Dr. Hafiz, as a council member of the Malaysian Allied Health Professions Council representing us, the medical physicists in Malaysia, I believe you have been very much involved in the development of this act. So can you please describe to us what does this act mean to us and how does it implicate us as practicing medical physicists in Malaysia? Right, okay, first of all, th uh, thanks Dr. Ong um, for having me today. Uh, and uh, Assalamualaikum and good morning all um, our audience today, as well as uh, fellow panelists. Um, and also I would like to thank uh, Dr. Jimmy and the committee for organizing this timely forum. And also would like to congratulate the team as well as all supporting organizations for coming up with this uh, great programs over this International Medical Physics Week 2021. And it shows uh, our commitment to progress uh, the medical physicists uh, in Malaysia. So uh, happy International Medical Physics to all uh, here today. Um, so um, so my, uh, as, as what we heard from uh, Mr. Kumar on the Act 774 and uh, the council that has been established to regulate the practice of a light health practitioner in Malaysia, so it has the main agenda of uh, safety uh, and well-being of the public, most importantly. So now we can see that the profession is at a historic juncture in which the profession will be formally recognized and protected as a health profession. And that will give us an opportunity to improve our profession further so that we can offer better quality of services through our roles as the medical physicist and have impact to patient health and well-being. So in order to um, answer uh, Dr. Ong's question, so I've uh, divided my uh, presentation into four parts. So I'm going to cover the first three parts in this uh, session, um, which is the introduction to medical physics and medical physicists for, all, for the benefit of all audience today. Uh, the current status in Malaysia and also uh, on X774 and MAH, MAHPC, which is the council that is related to the medical physicist profession. So, and then I'll cover the challenges and opportunities on the second part of this forum. So, the introduction. Um, so, just to warm up, uh, make sure everyone's still awake. So, we'll start with an analogy using this uh, new beautiful drawbridge in Tungano in the east coast of Peninsula Malaysia. Um, so uh, medical physics uh, is actually a, a bridge, you can say, or um, a combination or uh, between two different but related fields. So maybe uh, the audience can type in uh, what do you think of the two fields are before I reveal the answer. I can't actually see the chat. Somehow, let me see. Okay, can see the comment. Okay. Right, just a few more seconds. I think most of uh, the answers are correct. So I'm going to reveal the answer. So yeah, the, the two fields are applied physics and medicine. So uh, the dimension is medical physics is application of physics principles in medicine and healthcare for analysis and treatment of human disease. So usually it involves the use of uh, the potentially harmful ionizing radiation. This includes the deadly high dose gamma or X-rays that we use to cure cancers in radiotherapy. 
So in terms of recognition, uh, the medical physicist has been recognized uh, it, under the International Labour Organization, which is under U the United Nations since 2018. Um, so you can see here in terms of the grouping. So it is uh, placed under the physical sciences professions, under the physicist subgroups. And uh, the medical physicist is an occupation classified under the subgroup of these physicists and astronomers. Uh, okay. And in terms of uh, the international recognitions, so we know uh, the International Atomic Energy Agency, which is the relevant agency, uh, has published a document on the profession in, back in 2013. And uh, we all know that Malaysia is a member state of IA, which has a statutory objective to accelerate an enlarged contribution of atomic energy to peace, health, and prosperity, including medical education. So this is also on top of their famous role as a nuclear watchdog of the United Nations to make sure that the technology not being used for military purposes. So the definition is in line with the nature of medical physics field, which is um, individual with education and specialist training in the concept and techniques of applying physics in medicine. And they should be com clinically competent to practice in the medical physics field. Okay. So you can refer to this uh, document uh, uh, published by IA back in 2013. It's available on the website. And if you look at uh, Malaysia, so we are, have yet actually formally used the designation as a medical physicist uh, formally and clearly um, because um, by designation um, in the public sectors, um, the medical physicists uh, are known as the science officers. Um, in the private sectors, uh, they are referred as the medical physicists. And also in the university hospitals, those lecturers uh, that is contributing to the to the university hospital, uh, they are known as the university lecturer by designation. Though they are also supporting the, the relevant departments uh, for the medical physics services. Uh, in terms of the, the disciplines, so we can group them into four. First is the radiation oncology, where the field is therapeutic medical physics. Next is radiology. Uh, which the field is diagnostic medical physics, nuclear medicine, uh, nuclear medical physics, and also health physics, uh, which is involves the radiation protection and safety. So if you look at the rules, so you can see that um, the medical physicists work with the multidisciplinary team of um, the medical specialists, as well as our colleagues, uh, medical radiation technologists. Okay? So we work with them in order to assess and treat illnesses and disability. So the medical specialists are typically the oncologists, uh, the radiologists, nuclear medicine specialists, sometimes with neurologists and neurologists as well, whereas the medical radiation technologists are the radiographer and the radiation therapist. Um, so these are some illustrations on who are the people. Um, the multidisciplinary team involves in, for example, in radiology department, we have the radiologists, uh, the medical physicist in diagnostic imaging, as well as the radiographer. And in oncology, we have the oncologist, the radiation therapist, and as well as the medical physicist in radiation oncology. So the roles um, mainly is to protect um, the patient and healthcare workers from potential radiation hazards. This is led by the medical physicist. Um, so they are also involved with the commissioning, uh, calibration, safe operation and quality assurance of imaging and radiotherapy system, as well as they are also involved uh, with radiotherapy treatment planning uh, for cancer treatment. They also, um, um, oh, okay, so they, they, so we know that improper use of radiation will contribute to potentially un unnecessary radiation side effects and death. Um, so uh, even in um, country with, uh, very uh, good monitoring in terms of radiation safety uh, it can happen. So, so mistakes can happen even in, in, in such situation and also that can happen. So this, they, so, so we can see that the medical physicist has a very important role to ensure that the, the treatment and the diagnosis uh, perform uh, in a safe manner. So when we refer back to the IA document that has come up with the definition of what is medical physicist, also the document has set uh, specific requirements 
for the qualification of um, the medical physicists. So they listed three main components for the academic and clinical training of a medical physicist. So the first is the university degree in physics or equivalent physical or engineering sciences. So if you look at the document, the deficient is uh, two years undergraduate topics in physics and mathematics. And then the postgraduate uh, level education in medical physics, number two. Uh, and after that is the clinical training for a period of not less than two years in one of the specialties in medical physics that I've mentioned earlier. Um, so this should be in a form of structured residency program supervised by a senior. So the academic education program in physics and medical physics fundamentally prepares a student to enter a clinical training later under supervision before becoming an independent medical physicist. So it also provides the student with the basic knowledge needed to embark on a career in the regulatory industry, metrology, research and development, or innovation through research sectors, uh, for example. So one of these broad foundation students are then able to build more advanced specialist studies in particular branches of medical physics, depending on their preferences later. So that, that is why they have uh, this framework, which is also in line with other countries in the world. So internationally, if you look at the Europe, I think it's a bit more, even a bit more stringent. They have um, two levels of education, the bachelor degree, the master degrees, and then the clinical training, like what's stipulated in IE document, as well as they have a definition for the medical physics expert, which is based on the uh, experience post uh, clinical training once they become the independent uh, medical physicists. And they also have certification uh, framework, which I think we will cover in details tomorrow in, in the, uh, the forum session. Um, then if you look at closer to Malaysia, uh, we have Australia. So Australia also have um, a minimum postgraduate level education in their qualification framework for medical physicists. They also have the radio pharmaceutical scientists in, in their, um, in their uh, uh, policy as well. Um, in Indonesia, I'm sure we're going to hear more from Dr. Suprianti late, Suprianto later sorry, um, on the certification framework. So the uh, clinically qualified medical physicist also requires a master's degree in medical physics uh, and uh, to, be, uh, to be deemed a uh, qualified medical physicist. So the next one is on the current, current status in Malaysia. So uh, in Malaysia, there, there are an estimated of over 300 medical physicists currently in the workforce. And the latest uh, national survey that covers uh, 106, 106 respondents um, here, uh, we can see the gender, race and age distribution of the medical physicists in the Malaysia. So this cover about one third of the workforce. And we can see there are more male, uh, more sorry, more female than male uh, in, in, in Malaysia, uh, which is also similar to the situation in many other countries in Asia. Uh, and almost 90% um, per, are between um, uh, age 21 and 40 years old, which shows that uh, the agility of the profession to grow further since many are at the early or mid level career. Uh, and, and we can see that the number has been steadily increasing since the year 2008, which is a good sign. And in, if we compare and benchmark the number to the global concentration of medical physicists, so this is actually a bit outdated uh, data, but this is the best I could get from APM. So, so if you look at the um, number of medical physicists per uh, million population, so we can calculate roughly, we have 30 million uh, pop population and um, then if we have about 300 medical physicists, that is about 10 per million population. Uh, and we can see that uh, Malaysia has a higher concentration than the global average, which is 2.7. Uh, and actually above the developing countries uh, and just slightly below the, the developed uh, countries and they show that in terms of number we are not so far behind developed countries and that actually has a established uh, profession recognition and qualification framework 
And um, in terms of uh, where they work, uh, majority are in the government sector. So even in our stats, we know that about 200 something uh, uh, science officers are in the public sectors. Uh, so you can see here, although this survey doesn't capture all, but it captures uh, all the sectors quite well. And we can see that most of them are in the radiotherapy uh, field. Uh, the next one is the diagnostic uh, radiology. Um, also a quite significant number in regulatory agency and also in nuclear medicine. So the rest that I mentioned was uh, in education sector, which are mostly lecturers. And these are probably are the, the people that works with the uh, equipment vendors. And um, in terms of the qualification, so, I mean, if you look at the, the, uh, the qualification of each of the physicists to answer the survey, so we can see that about 75% uh, or has a postgraduate degree and, and about 10% of them has a PhD. And we can see that in Malaysia, this is in line for the master degree. Uh, they, we have uh, two uh, long established uh, medical physics program. Uh, it has been established since the 90s. So those are the, these are the master in medical physics in University Malaya, as well as master of science in medical physics in University Science Malaysia. Um, and between these two programs, they provided uh, for 76% of the country medical physics workforce. Um, and another 5% is coming from the Master of Science in Nuclear and Radiation Safety in UKM. And the rest are masters by research in um, science and uh, engineering sciences, in physical science and engineering sciences. And uh, um, we look at the bachelor degree uh, qualification. Um, about more than half of them have a degree in physics and applied physics. And we also have quite significant number having a degree in nuclear uh, or radiation technology degree. So these are not uh, necessarily physics degree, but they have um, specialized content that covers the application aspect of the nuclear and radiation technology. 4% of them have engineering degree and 1% did not disclose uh, their, their degree. And in terms of the clinical training, uh, the length of clinical training you can see varies between the fields, but it shows that um, it exists, clinical training exists in Malaysia. And this is in line with the requirement for clinical training uh, of the medical physicists on the job that uh, upon hire. So although the current scheme is not formal or standardized, uh, we can see that it is, uh, it, we have it in, in Malaysia. Uh, we also, uh, I think I should also mention that we have the IA training scheme uh, that is expanding to the second cohort now though, that has uh, actually have more participants from the, 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 the medical physicists. And in terms of a salary, which is also an, uh, another important aspect, uh, in which the how much the profession is getting, so we can we can see that um, a majority uh, about forty two percent receiving salary per annum of less than fifty thousand here in this group, and those uh, this group actually has a medium uh, working year of four years and three years respectively. So four years for less than twenty five thousand, and three years for twenty five to fifty thousand. And we can see that if we compare this uh, against other professions in Malaysia, so we don't want to look far, we just compare with the, uh, uh, Malaysia. So we can see uh, the radiographer, which has a dedicated uh, grade, uh, health grade U41, has a salary of per annum of uh, about 29,000, so which is slightly above those um, lower group here, 25,000. And, and this salary is actually uh, lower than the median salary in Malaysia with uh, university level education, that is 47,000, okay? So we know that though patient in physics and medicine should be the key drive, but I think monetary reward is also important. At least it should be above the average salary uh, in Malaysia. Okay. Um, uh, putting the importance of uh, the role uh, of medical physicists in medical diagnosis and radiotherapy. 
um, because uh, from the survey we can see that it is currently um, this slightly lower like if you put the end bracket 50,000 this is lower than the median salary in Malaysia of uh, with people with English level education and if you look at the higher salary bracket here between um, 75,000 to 150,000 uh, then if you look at um, the median year of uh, the working years for each of the group depending on whether they are academic or lecturers the private sector medical physicists or the public public sector medical physicists we can see that um, in terms of they have different uh, median year of working so meaning that it took longer for certain sector to achieve this salary bracket compared to the other sector okay so um, the next is uh, we will look into the uh, act framework uh, we will just extend a bit on what uh, Mr. Kumar has uh, described earlier. Um, so we know that the Act has been enforced in 1st July 2020. So, and in terms of um, the allied health professions being regulated, uh, it also covers our colleagues in the departments, the radiographers and radiation therapists also our the help uh, a lot of prof professionals like the dietitian physiotherapist clinical psychologist medical lab scientists uh, so the council will act as the professional body the mhpc will uh, be the professional body similar to the malaysian medical council uh, for the for the medical doctors whereas uh, we have the medical physics organizations such as perfect uh, mom uh, institute of physics malaysia that can act as the professional organization or association of the profession, um, which is similar to the Malaysian Medical Association. And so far, the council has met uh, regularly to prepare for the registration and implementation, and there have been various committees established under the council. Okay. So I think I should cover also what are the committees being established so we understand the framework better and how we can use it to actually uh, improve our profession. So. Um, we have uh, the qualification committee, the joint technical committee uh, with the MQA. We have the ethics and practice committee. We have a fitness to practice committee. We also have continuing professional development committee. And we also have expert evaluation committee, investigating committee and disciplinary authority committee that actually we look at the, the specific aspect in the act that was uh, covered by Mr. Puma earlier. So we have a, a different section in the Act and different committee that we actually look at the particular aspects. For example, in order to make sure that the professions are being continuously uh, uh, having training. So this there is a CPD committee looking after this in, in order for the profession to have a standardized education uh, framework. There is this uh, JTC committee with MPA that, that has been established looking into this. There's also the qualification committee that I will talk further on looking into what are the qualifications uh, to be uh, endorsed for each of the profession. Okay. So um, we have uh, three professional organizations for medical physics in Malaysia. So depending on the committee, the, the appointment of the profession's representative, either from the academy or clinical sector, or both uh, in each of these committee uh, being established by the council. So uh, first committee- Dr. Hafiz, sorry Dr. Hafiz. Can I, can I request you to speed up this round please? Because due to the time constraint. Oh yeah, sure. I'll, I'll cover this, not much more slides. All right, thank you. So the qualification committee, uh, this is the terms. So if you look after the, the qualification standard of, of the profession. And uh, there are two sections. One is section 16 um, for, for the new um, physicists coming into uh, the, that will be registered. And section 46 is for the physicists that, that are currently in the workforce. So these have two different sections. For those in the workforce will be under section 46 and new one will be under section uh, 16. And so uh, section 46 will register those currently in practice. So those are there are things to be considered looking at the current qualification. 
of the medical physicists in the workforce. And if you look at uh, some examples from other profession that are relatively more established, like for example, the dietitians. So they can stipulate for section 16 Bachelor of Dietetics because they are, have a program standard in MPA that actually clearly explain what is uh, what uh, the dietetics program should include in terms of the body of knowledge. And for section 46, they requires proof of practice in dietetics as well as Bachelor of Dietetics. And for the clinical psychologists, um, uh, they set a master of clinical psychologists, which is also defined well in the MPA program standard. Um, and also, um, this is also defined in those currently in the workforce. Um, this is for our um, colleague, diagnostic radiographer. So, because they have um, upgraded their qualification uh, requirement to a bachelor degree from diploma before, so they have stipulated a bachelor degree in section 16 for those new. Uh, uh, people joining the workforce, but those existing in the workforce will require a, a either bachelor degree or diploma in radiography for those graduated uh, older back in 2004 or before. They also have a program standard well defined in the MPA. And so these are some of the references that uh, the standards that I've mentioned earlier, if you want to actually look at. So we have at the moment the, the two MPA standard that is related to the profession are the program standard for medical and health sciences. So you can see most of the profession are, that are being regulated under the DSEX are, have this program standard at MPA already, except for the medical physicists. Um, and the psychology is in a, a different a standard in psychology. And there are also the national education code manual that define the, the fields uh, of the, the, the degree in at the MPA level. I think uh, that's all from me. I'm going to cover the next one on challenges and opportunities in, in the next uh, session. Thank you. All right. uh, thank you, Dr. Hafiz, for enlightening us on the significance of this act uh, on medical physics profession in Malaysia. Now, from the presentations by the uh, two previous speakers, it is clear that the allied health profession was established to regulate certain allied health professions in this country, including medical physics. Now. As discussed before, this act involves the registration of practicing medical physicists in this country as part of the regulation. Now, one neighboring country that has established the registration of medical physicists is Indonesia. And this morning, we are privileged to have Dr. Suprianto with us to share the experience of Indonesia in registration of medical physicists. Now, let me just share my screen here. So Dr. Suprianto obtained his PhD from the Medical University of Vienna, Austria in 2011. And he's now a lecturer at the Department of Physics, University of Indonesia. Dr. Suprianto holds numerous prominent positions in national and international medical physics association. He is currently the president of Indonesian Association of Physicists in Medicine and the general secretary of Southeast Asia Federation Organization for Medical Physics, CFOM. Dr. Suprianto is the national counterpart and coordinator for various IAEA projects in Indonesia, and he has published a total of 35 journal papers and proceedings related to medical physics. Now, thanks again, Dr. Suprianto, uh, for being with us this morning. And Dr. Supri, can you share with us the medical physics scenario in Indonesia, and how is this profession being perceived, regulated, and registered? Dr. Supri? Can you hear me? Yes. Okay. Uh, thank you very much, Dr. Um, for the introduction, and thank you again for the uh, organizing committee inviting me to share our experience uh, for the medical physics registration in Indonesia. It was me, uh, I'm the lecturer at the Department of Physics, as uh, Dr. O mentioned, uh, I'm also the working with the Indonesian Association of Physics in Medicine. Uh, this is outline for my talk. There's a little bit, uh, I will talk about the radiation medicine facilities in Indonesia, 
uh, some regulation about medical physics established in Indonesia and also some uh, information about the education and training. The professional scheme we developed in Indonesia, uh, health professional registration, and also I provide you the last is the statistic uh, medical physics in Indonesia. Yeah, uh, this is the data from the Indonesian Radiation Oncology Society that uh, this is the profile of the distribution of the radiotherapy center in Indonesia. And we have 34 provinces from the West, from Aceh to Papua, and uh, we have uh, 16 provinces already uh, serve the radiotherapy center. We have the 45 center and uh, around 90 radiotherapy machine with the uh, 50 Linux, uh, some cobalt and uh, gamma light and tomotherapy and uh, Yeah, this, uh, yeah, we have uh, some limited uh, facility for the nuclear medicine around uh, 17 center and uh, most of them in Java Islands. And we have some liking it uh, uh, other part of Indonesia. And the new center will be in the Kalimanta, uh, East Kalimantan. This uh, will be the candidate for the new uh, capital city. And this is uh, the data from the uh, Nuclear Regulatory Agency that uh, they already uh, mapping for the old facilities and also some medical physics already distributed in the province. And uh, the data talk about the number of the medical physics and also they, they, uh, about the distribution and also the ratio between the facility and the medical physics. So yeah. Uh, we, we have some uh, challenging uh, between the uh, between the number of the medical physics and uh, the facility for the diagnostic radiology because this is uh, I will mention uh, what the kind of the regulation and how to implement and uh, how the challenge for us to develop it and yeah this is the data from the regulatory agency this already divided for the city floor and mamo. And there's some number for the license uh, they already issued in the regulatory agency and around uh, 2000 license already issued. And there's some uh, more than five, uh, 800 for the city, Floro is oh, more than 400 and also Mamo around 200 something. So this is the uh, facility already uh, mapping in the nuclear regulatory agency. And yeah, I, I talk about the, regulation uh, actually uh, the medical physicist as the uh, as the professional health is uh, just established uh, as a recognized by the Ministry of health is uh, on 2007 uh, with the uh, decree of the Ministry of health because uh, in the government law in 1992 uh, the medical physics is, is not uh, have not been mentioned in the in this regulation in this uh, government law so that's why uh, by the Ministry of Health decree 2007, medical physicists uh, is recognized uh, as health professional in Indonesia. And uh, regarding with the, with, the, with the registration, actually uh, before, uh, I'm sorry, uh, in 2010, uh, some uh, uh, professional society, uh, some uh, professional health, they already established the, some registration but by their own, so uh, like the radiographers, uh, the pharmacies, uh, they, they, they have the regulation by their own, uh, by the, uh, some uh, regulation by Minister Health. But uh, in 2010, uh, uh, Minister Health decided to combine the all uh, health professional uh, except for the medical doctors. Because, uh, yeah, uh, they, they had their, their own the medical uh, concern. So, in 2012, uh, uh, medical physicists just started to registration uh, to do the registration in Indonesia because uh, actually before we we we, we just recognized 2007 and 2012 we just uh, uh, starting with the registration and yeah some regulation uh, established there for developing something probably in uh, Malaysia is uh, like health professional council and in, in Indonesia we starting with the recent health professional board and uh, we just uh, regulated now uh, we develop in the council 
with health professional counsel uh, except of the medical doctors but uh, we uh, i mean to combine uh, all professional like the pharmacy the fire a nurse everything in the health professional counsel i will talk a little bit in the, uh, later yeah, this is a regulation we, uh, in the Nuclear Regulatory Agency. This is the based on government law uh, 97, and they regulate some uh, government regulation. And uh, the Nuclear Regulatory Agency issued uh, some regulation regulated for the diagnostic radiology, uh, radiotherapy, and also nuclear medicine. They mentioned about the medical physicists there as the uh, as the uh, requirement to issue the license for the medical uh, facility. This uh, regulation starting in 2011, uh, 2012, and 2013 uh, for diagnostic uh, nuclear medicine and radiotherapy. At the moment, uh, the medical physicists, uh, we still have the problem because we have the two uh, professional society and with some difficulties uh, with the registering of the members uh, and we have some uh, issue about the uh, numbers and uh, but I will, I will talk about the how uh, we develop and how to uh, solve this problem and the nuclear regulatory agency also just uh, amendment this regulation uh, for the diagnostic we have two uh, regulation now is the for the compliance testing for the radiology uh, and uh, diagnostic and intervention now this is uh, regulate about the external audit for the diagnostic radiology and also mention who uh, can be the tester, uh, medical physicist also there and uh, some uh, regulated about uh, complaint testing. But for, for the radio safety in diagnostic radiology, they also still mention the medical physicist is uh, as the requirement for the issue for the license and also regulate for, for, for the some uh, the quality assurance document uh, for the uh, Relicensing in the future, and uh, we also have some uh, regulation about the uh, uh, radon safety uh, in uh, in uh, for the radon protection of ISR because this is connecting with the, some regulation from the Ministry of Health that the Ministry uh, medical physicists also the radon protection of ISR, but the certification for of, uh, safety of ISR is. Uh, do by, by the nuclear regulatory agency. Yeah, this is some uh, historical from uh, chart from the, our uh, uh, government, the 2007, the Minister of Health Decree for the Medical Fees as Health Professional, 2008, the Ministry of Civil Servants, uh, this for, for the government employee, uh, mentioned about the, how the career path for the medical physicists because this important thing to be the uh, some uh, benchmark for, for the private because in Indonesia uh, we normally regulate in the, for the government employee first and the private will follow uh, the regulation and uh, yeah we amendment for the government law for for the health uh, for the health so they already. Uh, we already established the health professional and medical physicists already mentioned in the government law. And the Ministry of Health uh, issue for the standard practice for the medical physicists in 2015. And they already, uh, and also Minister of Health uh, just issued uh, last year about the professional standard for medical physicists and also mentioned about uh, the qualification of the medical physicists uh, in Indonesia. Yeah, these uh, three regulators play a role that the Ministry of Education is uh, about for the education and also accreditation and also some certification collaboration with the professional society, the Ministry of Health uh, in the middle is for the qualification for health professional, uh, harmonization between the health professionals, something this uh, overlapping duties, I think radiographer, radiotherapists, uh, uh, medical physicists, they have do a uh, uh, work together to avoiding some overlapping the duty and also the registration for the uh, health professional uh, same thing in, in Malaysia and working with the condition uh, continuing professional development and also re-registration and for the nuclear regulatory agency already mentioned about the some uh, licensing for the radiation equipment uh, regular compliance testing uh, regular the quality assurance program for radiation medical facility 
and regulate and manage uh, and also manage all the dues registration program in the uh, nuclear regulatory Yeah, this one, the education and clinical training. Uh, recently, we have the 10 uh, uh, program for the BC in physics with uh, uh, some uh, special, uh, not specific, but the elective course in medical physics and one bachelor engineering, uh, nuclear engineering with uh, uh, elective in the medical physics. Uh, and this comply with the uh, Ministry of Health uh, regulation that the standard profession for the medical physics only allow the two uh, graduated from physics uh, or nuclear engineering. So uh, besides the program, they cannot enter for, for the registration and also the uh, practicing in Indonesia. And currently we have the one master medical physics in the University of Indonesia, four with the master of physics and elective course with the medical physics or three PhD in physics with the elective course medical physics. And this is some scheme for the uh, historical for the for the training uh, clinical training program we develop uh, actually before 2000. Uh, mostly the the medical physics. Uh, yeah, come from the radiographers, they upgraded the knowledge. In 2000, uh, we, um, we already graduated some uh, uh, people from physics uh, background. And uh, after that, they're doing for the master and also on job training. Uh, during at the time, there's no clinical training established. And we have uh, IA grant uh, from 2007 to uh, 2015. Uh, to for the, uh, uh, for the equipment, for the education, for sending the people to overseas for for the learn about the clinical supervising uh, and extra. And 2016, we uh, piloting with the professional training from this uh, for the uh, uh, associate medical physics and also the Spanish training for the uh, security. So we, we trial and error, something like that. So uh, we, after that, we decided in 2018 with, uh, with the two scale. Uh, this, uh, our consensus now that uh, we only allow two, uh, prog uh, two graduate uh, bachelor from the physics and also nuclear engineering. Uh, they have took uh, professional training six to 12 months. And we call it the, we, we call it Indonesia actually uh, in the, in the uh, in English of the medical physicist, but uh, we we uh, can call it the associate medical physicist, and this is already recognized by Ministry of Health uh, in the Regulation 322 uh, 2020, and also Nuclear Regulatory Agency for licensing. But uh, for the CQMP, uh, we have the uh, piloting for the IEA 2016. Uh, this would be graded for master degree and also during uh, at least two uh, years of clinical training, they will become from the medic clinically qualified medical physicist or we call it the uh, second medical qualification in Indonesia. But these still are uh, recognized by a nuclear regulatory agency for licensing for the equipment. But uh, this is not uh, still not recognized by Minister of Health because uh, Mr. had uh, mentioned they ha we have we have to uh, issue the uh, the associate medical physics first before the uh, specialist program. Yeah, uh, yeah, we, we did in the University of Indonesia. We initiating for the associate medical physics training 2018. So before 2018, actually, uh, most of the physicists is come to from the graduate. Uh, I mean, from the bachelor of the physics. They can go directly to the clinic uh, before 2018. So they'll be practicing, most of them uh, already practicing there. And some, uh, we, we have the, some discretion uh, method before uh, 2018, we started with the associate medical physics training. And we started with batch one, uh, and until now it's batch seven. We already graduated the one, uh, almost 200 graduated and 84% now already employed in the hospital. Because the problem is based on the data from the local regulatory agency, uh, based on the calculation, uh, the regulation is uh, mandated that uh, will be uh, the need of the medical physics, uh, mostly in diagnostic radiology, 
the total is we we need uh, around uh, 1,500. So the problem is we, we if we applying the qualification with the master degree or the clinical training with the specialist program, it will be a uh, bottleneck for us. So that's why we decided into scale. We uh, associate medical physicists in the bridge to be the uh, probably the qualified medical physicist in the future. And then uh, this is some mapping. Uh, I already some uh, data for the placement uh, in the diagnostic radiology in the uh, radiotherapy and also nuclear medicine. Some of them also going for the education in research and also regulation uh, regulators. And most of the graduate from associate, we can see that uh, most of the graduate training program is goes to the diagnostic radiology. And uh, some of them is uh, in radiotherapy, but a uh, few people going to the uh, nuclear medicine because the nuclear, nuclear medicine facility was very few in Indonesia. Yeah, uh, this I present uh, about the uh, clinically qualified. We, we did the uh, uh, grandfathering 2015. We invited uh, Professor Kwan Hong Ong as the panel uh, for the uh, panel for certification, also uh, Dr. Jer uh, sorry, uh, Jerome for, for, from the Singapore uh, to yeah, some for the grandfather certification. Uh, at, the, at the time, it's 15 candidates and uh, only 12 passing the grandfathering certification. And uh, these two uh, started for, for the SEQMP, uh, for the residency program in 2016. So that's why in 2016, in October, we starting with the residence program. We actually uh, six candidates in wrong and one in diagnostic radiology, but one uh, withdraw from the process. And now already passed uh, from the program is five uh, medical physicists. And for the second batch, uh, we have uh, actually three, a uh, six, sorry. Six candidates for the wrong, but uh, during the process, six withdrawal because there's some uh, uh, going to the another uh, facility, like change from wrong to uh, nuclear medicine, and some is uh, from the wrong to the diagnostic, something like that. So uh, one is going to the education. So now it's left three, and we have the final exam in Q3, probably in September 2021. And uh, Recently, we we a little bit changed for for the uh, residency program. We are accepting each semester, uh, and we limited number is or three maximum four uh, because we also limiting uh, uh, facility to have the the uh, clinical uh, residency program because in Indonesia the clinical residency program is treating as student, not uh, as the employer. So this the uh, some challenging for us. So that's why, because the uh, the uh, demand of the uh, sexual P now is increasing, because the uh, the facility, new facility, uh, applying or establish the new uh, radiotherapy facility, the nuclear regula regulatory agency asked they to provide the CQMP for the high tech like the PMET, uh, MRT, and uh, another advanced technique. They have provided the uh, SecuMP, so that's why now it's increasing. So this is also the challenge for us to uh, provide the SecuMP uh, in the market. Yeah, this the uh, council we have. Uh, actually, we have the eleven council uh, in the in the Indonesian uh, med, uh, health professional council. Uh, except medical doctors is joined in this uh, council. It's a call it the. Uh, and uh, in medical physicists is uh, together with the with the radiographers, radiotherapists, uh, medical laboratory scientists, uh, orthotic prosthetic and electromedics uh, in one cluster call it the biomedical technique, something like that we call it. So uh, this uh, the yeah this this uh, council will have the, some uh, scheme for uh, uh, approving the application from the registration. And some the general requirement for the national ID for for the permanent for the uh, like in Malaysia for the non permanent or uh, uh, for the from the overseas they can apply but we have some limitation and some uh, regulation there. 
and also uh, the application should be a member of the professional society uh, recognized uh, because we uh, the minister had only uh, recognized one professional society. So that's why we uh, unification the two professional society in 2015. And uh, they also completing the training program, uh, photograph, and also uh, they have to uh, sign for the medical physic conduct statement. And for the associate medical physic, they have graduated from the basic physics or basic in nuclear engineering. The other, we cannot accept it. And completed professional training associate medical physics program. And for the second P, they have graduated for master degree. Uh, in physics or in medical physics, a completed residency program in Rome, uh, therapy or uh, nuclear medicine medical physics training program. And also from the re-registration, uh, the, they have to complete it uh, to, to collect 25 credit uh, CPD for uh, associate medical physics uh, and 50 credit for SecMP. And also they need the recommendation letter from the professional society to applying the re-registration. So this is uh, the system we have for the CPD online. Uh, this website is maintained by Minister of Health, but the, uh, organized by uh, professional society. Uh, after they uh, collect, they have the, some CPD uh, activities, they can put in the system. And then uh, after five years, because uh, we, the duration for the registration in Indonesia is for five years, and after five years, they can collect uh, 25 credit and they can do for, for the applying for the recommendation letter for the registration uh, with the 50 credit for the uh, associate and 50 credit for the SecMP. And they, after they have the recommendation letter, they can go for uh, registration to the Minister of Health website. This is in the right side. In the, this is for for the registration. And this system is linked with the uh, ID registration agency, like for uh, ID, something like that. And also Mr. Education for the uh, yeah, certificate, something like that. And this is a individual registration. Uh, they will be decided, probably like office will uh, decide it, uh, we can approve, but there is one council in the biomedical techniques. And then, uh, they get the registration number for the medical physics, and they will mention as the uh, associate medical physics or physical medic in Indonesia, or the physical medic qualification or SecQMP uh, qualification. Depend on depend on the certificate uh, proved by the uh, register. And this is the. Sorry, uh, Dr. Supri, can I request you to wrap up the? Yes. Question for this session. Yeah, Thank I you. think when we, when we will, will finish. And uh, this is the uh, registration uh, we have in 2012 is uh, 175, and 2000 is not many, uh, to 14, and the and uh, in 2017 this uh, already have the new and re registration for for the uh, uh, medical physicists, and this is uh, some scheme. And now we have. Uh, 509, this uh, in 2020, uh, now probably is uh, getting more. Uh, in our uh, professional society, we have a uh, membership uh, uh, 633, but this uh, including some, uh, they just a fresh graduate and also lecturer and also some uh, regulators, but regulators, uh, lecturer does need for registration uh, as the medical physicist in the uh, Ministry of Health. And this also we uh, invite addressing the, the Redison Protection Officer because this comply with the uh, missile health regulation. And this the uh, profile for the medical physic in uh, probably uh, Dr. Hafiz already mentioned. And yeah, this is the issue that we have. Uh, actually in 2008, this is a small number. And because this is, uh, we still have two society and 2015 we have unific unification and this is the profile on uh, the clinical medical physicists we have. And we have the issue now is the distribution in some part of Malaysia, Kalimantan, Sulawesi, and Papua. Uh, the big demand of the associate in diagnostic radiology, now is ratio is one, one physicist uh, to be handled for three facilities. And some of them is, uh, is four. Uh, 
uh, and demand of the security fee and the ROM is uh, increasing. And this is some um, uh, conclusion we have. There's some harmonization is very needed. Uh, some associate medical fees is a solution for current situation, but the bridge to be qualified medical fees in the future. And uh, I already mentioned before. Okay, this the uh, many people contribute uh, in the development of medical fees in Indonesia. Uh, and also, we also have the this webinar in this afternoon. Uh, okay, thank you very much. Thank you very much, uh, Dr. Supri, for sharing the experience from your country regarding the recognition and registration of medical physicists. Now, uh, there are a lot of questions in the Q and A chat, and let's probably just uh, try to answer some of these questions. But before that, uh, there are some questions on. Uh, clinical training, which is really interesting. But uh, as uh, to my understanding, what have been uh, presented just now, the registration currently is based on qualification-based framework. Now, uh, perhaps Mr. Kumar, can you probably describe to us the, is there any limitation with regards to the qualification-based framework uh, compared to competency-based framework? Okay, uh, thank you, Dr. Ang. I think the, the, there's a two different, there's a clear difference between the uh, qualification-based registration and the competency-based registration. And I think this is based on the country's policy and also the countries uh, at which junctures they are. If let's say, if you compare to the developing country, uh, definitely qualification based registration will be a choice uh, due to the fact due to the fact uh, the infrastructure to main, uh, to evaluate uh, to to set up the competency assessment is not available uh, most of the time it's not available in the in the, the country so qualification based uh, uh, registration will be a, a choice where they focus more on the qualification uh, make sure they have uh, enough uh, minimum level of competency to start registration. Uh, and then during the process of uh, uh, conducting their services, they will gain experience and so on. But if you refer to the country, which is developed country like, uh, like US and Australia, they go for more competency-based uh, com uh, competency uh, uh, registration because the system is there. Uh, once a person qualified from a university, the assessment system is decided by the professional themselves. They have a mechanism, they have an authority to look into the uh, competency aspect. And once they have fulfilled the uh, assessment, then, then they're allowed to register. So it depends on the country's uh, uh, current, uh, current state uh, or the policy. For Malaysia perspective, we follow the qualification-based uh, uh, registration because to the, uh, due to the fact that we have a small number of allied health at the moment. Uh, we still need a lot of uh, numbers to be in the, in the practice so that they can cater for the, uh, for the public. If let's say we start with a competency-based registration at the, at, uh, at the initial state, what will happen is the number of competent a light, uh, a light, especially in medical physicians, will be a very limited. That will go against the policy of a government to make sure that everybody able to get access to the service. So we need to look into the, uh, we need to have a win-win situation where the patient also able to receive uh, services. We don't want them to be uh, uh, what they call at disadvantage. And I think we can go with the qualification based on registration because we have a very good uh, authority that look into the qualification in the universities, which is MQA. They have already set a very uh, basic, uh, what do you call, uh, basic, uh, fundamentally it is, uh, it is already established. And then I think uh, our uh, qualification framework is uh, at par with a lot of uh, established country. So in that sense, uh, I think qualification-based uh, registration will be the uh, initial state. Once we have uh, enough uh, and, uh, infrastructure available, expertise available, then we can move on to the uh, competency-based registration. 
Uh, uh, thank you, Mr. Kumar, for the answer. It looks like a qualification-based framework is probably the, the initial step uh, for regist registering uh, our medical fees in the country. So Dr. Hafiz, can I ask your opinion, what are the challenges uh, for registering medical physicists in the, this country based on the uh, qualification-based framework? And can you also comment on the way forward, how the Light Health Act can regulate as well as develop our profession in the future? Okay, uh, thanks Dr. Ong for the question. So I'm going to continue um, that uh, to answer the questions, my slides on challenges and opportunities from this act. Uh, um, looking at our current status that I've presented earlier in Malaysia. So, go back there. All right. Um, so now we can see the medical physicist profession in Malaysia is at a critical juncture in which our decision will impact the rate of um, the profession uh, progression uh, in Malaysia. So now we can ask ourselves whether we want to remain in the status quo using the same thinking to solve the challenges that we are facing because uh, that might not be leading to anywhere. Uh, uh, at least uh, if it's not for the profession, uh, at least not, not for the health and safety of our patient more importantly. Or, or we can also try to see beyond our current situation and try to start thinking step to ensure progression of the field or profession in the future, like what's happening uh, in Indonesia. So um, um, back to the qualification framework that we're talking about. So in the act, we have two um, sections. One is the, um, for those new uh, yet joining the workforce. Uh, and also those currently in the workforce. Okay. So for section 46, it's clear that, I mean, for the benefit of the act, we want to actually register those currently in the workforce. So for section 46, it's clear to state, I um, mean, the council has agreed to state that um, we, it requires proof of practice in medical physics from uh, those currently in the workforce and also just uh, the degree in related fields, because we can see that based on the current workforce, the, not everybody has a master's degree. Um, although majority are, uh, majority does have master's degree, but not all. So in order for us to absorb all into the workforce, we, we need to set to the minimum uh, level of standard. But for section 16 here, we have a clean sheet. So we need to think about uh, how we can progress the profession further based on examples of other profession in Malaysia, as well as the rest of the world. Uh, and also we are not doing something new here and it shouldn't be complicated as the mission to Mars, but we also have to put the, the main priority. Um, what the main thing is to put the priority of the act is to protect the health uh, and well-being of patients and uh, not protecting the status quo that we have here. So, I mean, when we examine the current qualification of the medical physicists in the workforce, so these are some of the most um, common ones uh, in the workforce. I don't want to mention in terms of percentage how many are, but based on our studies, majority have the physics or applied physics uh, degree, but we also have those coming from the uh, radiation or nuclear technology degree. So uh, when we look at this, we can see that the uh, variation in terms of the type of degree, even based on the classification of the degree and uh, when we know we shouldn't judge the book by its cover, it shouldn't be based on the name of the degree. So uh, we look at the body of knowledge of the degree and we analyze um, the, the component of the degree based on the amount uh, of the fundamental physics component, uh, which is uh, separated to mathematics and computing, but these are con con combined into the fundamental physics and mathematics component. Uh, as required by IEA in the first degree. We also have the professional medical physics component uh, uh, percentage uh, and also the clinical practice. So, so we can see here there are programs, uh, there are pure physics or applied physics program that has uh, sufficient fundamental physics knowledge, but uh, maybe lacking a bit on the professional medical physics degree. Uh, but there are also other programs that does the opposite in which covers very little fundamental physics, 
but covers more on the um, professional medical physics module and also the clinical training aspect. But I think, I mean, if you look at the overall, um, the, the majority of the degrees, uh, they are mostly the pure and applied physics degree. And, um, and then we, I mean, according, uh, that is actually in line with uh, IA requirements. And that can, the professional medical physics module can be supplemented when they actually take the master's in medical physics or master of science in medical physics in either USM or UM. These are just differences in the name, but when we look at the content of the two masters, they are very similar. And then the next one is beside the, um, the issues on the education background, as well as the training background that are not harmonized, but at least we have a majority with postgraduate degree, even though we don't have the MPA program standard yet, compared to other profession that is being regulated uh, by the Act. Uh, we also have, uh, for clinical training, we already have uh, Ministry of Health uh, existed credentialing pathway. In which that new hire, you would have to go through the clinical training when they actually join the workforce. We also have the Pioneer IA clinical training scheme that uh, is going on and actually uh, getting more training into the, the scheme. So these are the part in which we think that can support the clinical training uh, requirement when they actually being registered. Okay, so be, because we, like we discussed earlier, this is qualification based framework. So we are not able to include this clinical training into the qualification requirement for the registration. Okay. And we also have this issue of the workforce structure and which where the main thing is on the, 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 um, the departments in, in, the, in the Ministry of Health. So we uh, acknowledge that um, they can be either in the hospital based um, department or regulatory department and they can be moved around between these two departments. Uh, and also we have those in the university hospitals that is not under Ministry of Health. Uh, we have medical physicists in the private hospitals and we have the academic medical physicists in the university hospital. So this uh, variation in the workforce structure and also education and training background pose a challenge in, in terms of um, how to harmonize um, this. And also, if you look at the qualification of other multidisciplinary members in the department, so we can see that the, the doctors, the specialist doctors, um, have the necessary qualification, which is the master's in either radiology or clinical oncology, depending on the specialties. And we know that our medical radiation technology colleague now requires a degree in order for them to practice uh, um, under this act. Uh, and but um, our medical physicists uh, is still um, um, have um, issues on in terms of harmonization of the qualification required to become a medical physicist. And also uh, we can also look at just now we look at uh, ourselves, we look at the, our colleagues, and now we can also look at the field that we are play, playing our roles in. So we can see that uh, now we have uh, a lot of advances in the physics technology in the clinic. Um, I mean, with the recent advances in the field, so we need to, to ask ourselves, are we able to provide the state of the art service for the benefit of our patient um, with our current qualification framework that is not harmonized? And also, I mean, if we look at the patient perspective, is it fair to deny the patient uh, at least the common um, advanced image guided radiotherapy treatment technique because uh, our skills limit us from doing that. So, so and also we're looking at the current education framework with some qualification having very little physics fundamental, are the graduates later will be able to adapt their technical skills to provide safe um, a, a particle accelerator based radiotherapy that is mushrooming up now in the world even in our neighboring countries. So I think those we need to consider uh, in, in this juncture. And also if you look at the future and we are we now, I think we can ask ourselves um, how would the medical physicists fit into the changing scenario and are we prepared to explore the newer technologies or are we having the qualification for us to do that? And how about whether our curriculum is adapting to the changing needs of, of uh, the field. Okay. So um, 
but then uh, we can also look at our strength. Uh, okay, um, like for example, we have our must we have established master qualification frameworks in which that, um, one of it is actually accredited by IPAM UK. Um, so, um, so this is one way to harmonize the education um, uh, of the medical physicists in this country through section 16 for those new hire so that we can have a, 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 a harmonized qualification of the physicists in Malaysia. And already based on the demography, 70% of the workforce, workforce has master qualification. And actually, our, I know intake, because we have many physicists now in the work, workforce, the annual intake of the uh, physicists uh, is actually over the supply of the, the master's graduate. So, I mean, with this requirement, uh, of master qualification. So those, uh, we don't have shortage of in graduates coming that we need to hire into the workforce uh, based on the current annual intake. So it's typically around 30 uh, uh, new graduate every year, but the workforce usually requires less than 20 uh, new hire uh, every year. And also we can look at our other health profession that is being regulated like clinical psychology uh, also setting up um, uh, masters, have already managed to set up masters as their minimum qualification and has the JPA approved um, uh, for, uh, has, has JPA approved the workforce framework like I shown earlier, have different pay skills for those with master qualification. And in terms of the, the degree prerequisite for, it to, for them to continue with their master's degree, we have over 20 degrees of physics from uh, 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 our local universities and actually 53% of the workforce has the, the, this degree qualification. So if we can put this in a single slide, so we can see we have the main challenges in the current workforce structure that varies between sector and that is divisive within the public sector. We have the variation of education and training program in the workforce and how we can use the act as a tool to catalyze improvement with the support of the professional team members around the profession and the established framework and how our status quo need to change to prepare us with what is already happening in the field and also coming in the future and how hope we can clearly see the importance of harmonization and way forward and, and the fact that we cannot simply use the international framework that's stipulated by AEA because uh, we already have uh, 300 related uh, posts uh, as medical physicists in the profession and we need to actually include them uh, and regulate them uh, through this act. So, and also being in this AHP framework as well, uh, we can actually look at other uh, established profession that provide us some reference on how to move forward within our national framework so that we can continue to grow. So um, this is my last slide, sorry, it's a bit wordy, but I need to make sure that the message come across. So, um, so we know that medical physics is a physics profession in healthcare. It requires fundamental knowledge in physics at degree level and specialized medical physics training at master level. And majority of the, those current in the workforce has this qualification. And those that doesn't have this qualification will be grandfathered and will be absorbed uh, under the Act through Section 46. And it's uh, also good to see that 90% of the workforce are younger generation, um, less than 40 years old, like I shown earlier in the slide, and has gone through on-job clinical training to a certain extent. Um, Well-trained and educated medical physicists is required to ensure the safe and efficient use of radiation physics technology in diagnosis and treatment of diseases. And we know that improper use can determine public health and deadly. And establishment of minimum master qualification will provide growth uh, of the profession and the field in Malaysia to catch up with the rest of the world, including neighboring countries. Uh, also, standardization and harmonization of qualification should be tackled by the universities and through MPA program standard that is currently going in parallel. Um, there should be also provision of transition phase for programs affected. So we are not going to deny the graduates from actually um, being qualified at the current stage. So there'll be a transition phase, of course. Uh, improvement in the current public service structure can be justified following the upgrade in the qualification scheme. 
that uplift all science officers as health professionals, so having proper academic qualification. So this would be a better justification for us to actually seek, for the, for the profession to actually seek um, uh, revision of the structure um, in the public service. And also recognition of the profession as a healthcare professional will bring the process one. So I mentioned sal the salary earlier. So when we have been recognized as healthcare profession, so hopefully development and training funds will be better, better salary, and also maybe critical allowance availability. And also um, last but not least, so the strong support from the medical physics professional organization. So ideally a strong organization. At the moment we are, we have several, so we can look at how we can have actually a unified strong organization to make this juncture a successful turning point. Uh, that's all. Thank you, Dr. Uh, thanks very much, Dr. Hafiz, for a very uh, complete uh, explanation. Uh, talking about growth, uh, Dr. Supri, can you please sh uh, share with us uh, the growth of medical physics profession in your country? And is this profession highly recognized? And what catalyst its development in Indonesia? Okay, thank you, Dr. Oh. Yes, uh, as I mentioned, that the, uh, actually the this prof, uh, the medical physics uh, previously before before the regulation by, by by the nuclear regulatory agency and also Ministry of Health, this actually uh, just uh, probably the just in radiotherapy established. I mean. Uh, mostly because in the in the therapy is uh, in process of the uh, planning and also uh, for, for, for the uh, clinical uh, treatment. So that's why at the time is most uh, stay in the radiotherapy department. But uh, by the regulation, uh, we are working together with the people in the uh, nuclear regulatory agency. We we we. Uh, Actually, was together uh, at the time we uh, really support by like, the uh, chairman of the nuclear regulatory agency. At the time, uh, that's why we uh, they released the three uh, main of the uh, uh, regulation in diagnostic, uh, in radiotherapy, and also nuclear medicine. Actually, uh, in radiotherapy, probably is uh, not a uh, big uh, challenge at the time because most of the I mean medical physicists already there. But uh, the more, more challenge at the time 2011 is, uh, is really in diagnostic radiology because uh, they uh, uh, require the medical physicists in the process licensing, but the supply, we still have the problem because uh, I think it did the same uh, discussion in Dr. Kumar, also uh, Dr. Hafiz, that the uh, uh, is a long process to be the base competency base uh, at the time. So now also still in the process. So that's why we, we have some, some uh, long process discussing, debating with the stakeholder. It's not easy. Uh, at the time, uh, we are uh, debating for the master or uh, bachelor. This is the very debating uh, because if we took uh, the master uh, degree, there's some hospital they, they, uh, in the uh, government sector, they have the uh, post position for the master degree. but. At the time, is uh, no nobody can apply because uh, because uh, some people are doing for the study. There's much going stay in Java and the position in Sumatra is not easy. So that's why 2015 we have uh, uh, as I mentioned, is there some uh, like uh, revolution or, or the our system that uh, we unified because uh, two organization. Without, uh, we, we cannot uh, work with uh, everything. So that's why we, we decide to unify to organization. This is the big, uh, big deal for us and also big consensus. The consensus is uh, we uh, uh, starting point or minimum uh, qualification is the bachelor degree in physics or in nuclear engineering uh, with the, uh, uh, some approval of the clinical practice. So that's why 2015, 2018, we have some transition phase to do that. So after 2018, we mandatory we, uh, without the uh, certificate for for the uh, training, uh, some training for the associate medical thesis, they can go to the registration and they can go to the job. 
even for my student, uh, I mean, uh, all the students. So that's why this the harmonization and also we do for the harmonization for the curriculum for the bachelor actually because yeah, we, we, we work uh, on this. So yeah, sometime that the uh, syllabus, we develop with something that uh, quite similar with the, in the master degree, but we reduce with the qualification something uh, the advanced technology we dedicated for the qualified and also master degree, but we uh, provided in the qualification for the associate they can do for the three specialists in diagnostic, uh, ergotherapy, and nuclear medicine. I think correlate with the some uh, one question I think uh, in, in the chat box. Uh, uh, inform the associate they can do for the but after. They, they can do for the specialist program. So this is the video in Indonesia. Thank you, Dr. Thank you very much, uh, Dr. Supri. Now, uh, we'll use the rest of our time, probably about 10 minutes, to answer some of the questions in the Q&A tab. There are quite a number of questions in the tab, and some of the questions have been answered uh, in the chat box, uh, in the tab itself. So do check out the answers provided by our panelists. Now. The first question I have here is, uh, where will the training for medical physicists take place? From what I see, the current clinical medical physicists do not have deep knowledge, which is the, or fundamental knowledge to train those trainee, which includes univ university lecturers, do not have much clinical knowledge as well. So yes, uh, probably Dr. Hafiz, can you comment on this? Oh, I think this is referring to, thanks Dr. Ong. This is referring to the training framework presented by Dr. Supri, right? Um, yeah. yeah. Yeah, but I think I think this the in uh, Malaysian is so it's not proper to answer this question. <laughs> All right, yeah. Um, yeah, because uh, now I think the, the, the training framework now, the formal one is to IEA. Uh, so this is done at the hospital, private and public hospital. So um uh, and I, i'm not sure about the other training framework the one on the job training uh, uh part of the um said credentialing pathway for the ministry of health is also done in the public uh hospital so it doesn't involve um those not well trained i i, would, I believe or, or i got the question um incorrectly i'm not sure but that, but that's the current framework that we have in english all right uh for the second question, uh, when will when we we'll start to implement? I, I suppose it's referring to the act or regist registration of medical physicists, because it says that we do we haven't got any official letter from MOH for enforcement of registration, and what will be the impact if we do not, do not register? Perhaps, uh, Mr. Kumar, can you comment on this question? Okay, um, uh, I think uh, they, they want to know where the money goes, right? Uh, basically, uh, this is an administration fee that it will be imposed on the registrant. So once we apply, so the, the whole process will take will be considered uh, that you are paying for that processing and also uh, to, to get the certificate itself. And if you compare to all the other councils in Malaysia, I think we, we put the minimal uh, fee uh, which is for the pro processing and so on. I think uh, other professions also are trying to increase the fee and so on, but we are starting with a very minimal fee. And for the government, yeah, it won't be any issue because they can, I think they will be exempted. Uh, it, it, is, it is called exempted because it's actually government paying the government back, something kind of uh, that scenario. Uh, when will it be implemented? Okay. Um, as you all know from the, my presentation, we, we said the act was and an gazetted in 2016, enforced in 2020. Why we enforce the act first is because we want to set up the council, because council is needed to make a lot of a decision. Because prior the act, we can't make a decision because uh, the, the, the power is given only for the council. So once the council has convened, they have looked through the uh, issues that are pertaining the registration. So they decided to postpone the registration until further no notification. So the further notification is depends on how fast we can resolve the issues. 
especially uh, we are looking into amending the uh, schedule two to make sure the listed profession are, uh, are the car, are current and all the name that they use in the listed is uh, applicable internationally. Uh, beside that, <clears throat> they also are trying to make sure we go for online registration. So online registration will help us a lot in cutting the time for registration because uh, uh, comparing to other profession where they, they started as a single profession, we, they can have a very limited number, then they can uh, use the whole one year to register. We have 23 type of profession. And if the registration start as a manual, and I think it will take a longer time for us to complete the registration. So we, we will focus on the uh, online registration. So once we have fulfilled all these issues and the government, uh, especially the council, will issue a public announcement on the date of registration start. So definitely at the moment, there's no official letter because we already uh, issue a press statement by the chairman of the council, uh, the chairman of the council, which is the, uh, the, the DG itself, uh, director general, which is the uh, country itself, have uh, issue a letter saying that, uh, issue a press uh, statement uh, stating that uh, the registration has been postponed uh, until a further notification. So with that, Definitely, we will inform all the uh, related uh, uh, or affected uh, participants in the, in the country uh, when the registration starts. And I think a lot of people are asking what will be the impact. So definitely, the impact will be very, very uh, much on you as a, register, as a practitioner. Because uh, I think people are uh, not so... Uh, when, the, when the act itself started, not, not many uh, practitioners uh, Pay attention on the on the impact. Uh, basically, the impact is if you don't register, you cannot practice. So that's the biggest impact that you, know, you cannot can continue practicing. But uh, saying that, you will be given a grace period. So the, it is called a transition or provisional period where you will be given us enough ample of time for you to apply and register yourself, get yourself registered. And, and we also trying to come up with a, a, a fairer grandfathering clauses where we will make sure that the current workforce not be at disadvantage when the registration start. That means we will try to absorb every single uh, practitioner who is able to prove that they've been practicing before the uh, registration start. Uh, with, with, with with that uh, commitment from the council, I think uh, the current workforce shouldn't be worried whether they will be left out for registration. Let's say for, for the, let's say we started with a competency base that that might be a big problem. That's why qualification based registration will be a better option to, for us to start the ball rolling. And then uh, setting the qualification uh, will be depending on the profession themselves. Like they they need to decide what will be the appropriate qualification and so on. Okay, uh, that's all from my side. Uh, Mr. Kumar, can I, I get you to answer the next question as well? There's a question <clears throat> on, is it compulsory to have indemnity insurance for medical physicists, uh, like a uh, okay. medical officer? Yeah. <clears throat> okay, uh, if you, uh, it's a good good point that they, they raised. I thank the participant actually pointing out this. Uh, uh, at the moment, uh, compulsory, uh, for indemnity, it's not, it's, it's not an option by the council. That means council is not making it compulsory at the moment yet. Because if you see medical officer, they have just started compulsory indemnity last year. They have been regulating uh, medical officers since 71, 1971. So only last year, they started to make sure it become an indemnity insurance become a, uh, what do you call, uh, compulsory. We need to see the ecosystem, whether the ecosystem is able to, if let's say the council decided to put the indemnity insurance as a requirement, where, where the industry able to provide enough indemnity insurance or fair in insurance to the uh, practitioner or not. So these are the issues that we need to clarify, where, where the council need to discuss with our insurance players and also the other, other, other uh, authority and deciding to make it compulsory. But we encourage the practitioner to take, especially the one working in the private sectors, or if they are working independently. 
they are the one who really need the indemnity. Why indemnity important in the such a way is uh, because let's say the moment you start register, you become a registered practitioner, you have a practice certificate, you are liable for complaints. When you are liable for complaints, people can take action against you, can take legal action towards you. And if anything goes wrong, you have to face legal uh, implication. So at that moment, what will happen is if you don't have insurance covering you, you may be, you may be, uh, you you will not be able to defend yourself in the court of law because you can't afford to have a lawyer to represent you. Or the if let's say you're found guilty, what will happen is you will be uh, uh, you'll be uh, asked to pay a huge amount of uh, penalties where you may not you end up become a bankruptcy because you're unable to play. So these are the things that you need to think before you, 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 you decided not to take uh, insurance. So from a council point of view, at this moment, we are not making it compulsory. We will encourage you as a voluntary basis, but in future, if there's a need for the government to intervene and make it compulsory, they will do timely. Okay, thanks. All right, thanks, Mr. Kumar. All right, I think, uh... We are about time here, it's 12 p.m. So we have to end this forum. Thanks for all the questions and for some of the answers, you can actually uh, view the answers in the under the Q&A tab. Now, I would like to thank all our three panelists, uh, Mr. Kumar, Dr. Hafiz, and Dr. Supri for the very enlightening sharings and information uh, on the allied health profession that has been implemented. Now, I'm sure all of us are now clearer on what the act is all about and to act accordingly to get ourselves registered, registered to be able to practice as a medical physicist. I'd like to thank all the viewers out there. We have a strong participation of about 139 uh, viewers for all the questions posed to our panelists as well. And do not forget that uh, tomorrow will be Well, tomorrow we'll be having another interesting session at 9 a.m. on the International Medical Physics Certification Board, IMPCB, accreditation and certification with uh, four renowned international speakers, which will be moderated by Dr. Ginny Wong. So please join us for the webinar tomorrow. And so uh, last but not least, I wish to uh, yeah, just stop sharing. Uh, so I'll just uh, wish everyone have a good day and stay safe. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Long. Thank you, Dr. Long.